Our speakers today are Mike Nicolian, Director of Market Sectors and Safety at SMACNA, and Chris Lee, the Program Manager of CPWR's Solutions Program and Website. And with that, I am going to go ahead and close this slide, and Mike, I will hand it over to you to get us started. Okay, uh, good afternoon or good morning everyone. My name is Mike McCullion. I'm with uh, SMACNA, uh, Chanel Air Conditioning Contractors National Association. But uh, for this webinar, for the purpose of this webinar, I'll be wearing the hat of the chairman of the ANSI and ASSC A10 Committee Convention to Design Technical Report that is in development that we've been working on for a while through that committee. So this is what the slides will, will focus on is that report. So to begin with, uh, you know, convention through design has a number of different um, definitions. This is just one from NIOSH that, that talks about the fact that addressing occupational safety and health needs and design process, which is very important, the design aspect of everything. And it can, it can pertain to construction, manufacturing, maintenance, facilities, a number of different things. So convention through design has a number of different um, applications, if you will. But we're going to be talking about prevention through design and construction. Uh, specifically the fact that there are several names for that. It's also known as design for safety or safety by design, but it's often strictly for construction process, uh, being conscious of and valuing the safety of the, of the workers and making design decisions early on in the process. That's the whole point of it. So the benefits of prevention to design, they're typical for safety programs. Um, if you've been in safety for a while, or if you're familiar with these kind of things, these are typically what, as safety professionals, we strive for for our organizations. Uh, reduce site hazards, uh, so therefore we can lower, lower the injury rates. Increased productivity is important. Workers' compensation, uh, increased designer constructor collaboration, specifically prevention through design, um, improving morale. So these are things that we should all be striving for within our safety programs as well as within prevention through design. So prevention to design can graphically, you can look at it this way. The ability to implement safety is a lot easier in the very beginning of the stages of the project schedule. So in conceptual design, then detailing through procurement, through actual construction, and then finally to startup. If you wait till startup and such like that, and at that stage of the, of the construction, it's very difficult to get design factors implemented to to. Oh. Mike, sorry, okay, I think we lost Mike for a minute. I can see that he is not connected. Uh, Chris, I don't know if it's easy for you to go into your part um, or if we just hang tight for a second. So? Chris? Yes, can you hear me? You were muted. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can wait for a minute or so. Okay, um, all right, sorry everyone. Uh, hopefully Mike will be right back with us. Yeah, if he doesn't hop back on in about 20 seconds, I could go ahead. You could just uh, pass me the uh, tools. Okay. Okay. 
believe he's still talking because he's advancing the slide. Yes, he uh, messaged me privately, so he knows that he's disconnected. Uh, hopefully, we're getting him back on momentarily. All right, we are just going to go ahead and uh, do Chris's portion of the presentation, and hopefully Mike will be able to get back on. So, Chris, I am handing over control to you. Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, while we get Mike back on the phone, uh, I want to thank everyone today for joining us on this presentation. Again, my name is Chris, and I help manage a website called Construction Solutions, which is an online tool that helps you find health and safety information and effective controls that we call solutions for hazards found in the construction industry. So my content of focus today would briefly highlight a few solutions that centralizes around the concept of PTD. Uh, for my portion of the presentation, I will not use any slides, but instead give you a live demonstration of the site by doing a screen share. Uh, quick intro, this is the Construction Solutions homepage. The overarching goal of this database is to create awareness of these solutions and hopefully influence adoption. So we organize finding solutions in two ways. You can use a filtering process where you first choose a construction task, uh, then you'll select, then you'll select a task, and then associate a hazard to that task, and then pick a solution on the right-hand side of the page. Or you can list uh, solutions by topic where they are grouped by common themes. So to list all the solutions related to PTD, we'll click here, where I will focus on these 10 today, but we have a few more developed that should be live within the next couple of months, so be sure to check back from time to time. And it might include the Buy Quiet initiative as well as um, tool designs that helps uh, reduce vibration. So, first off, here is an example of applying the PTD concept in tools to help prevent occupational injuries from cutting and beveling pipes. A sprit flame release, or also known as clamshells, is a tool that clamps around a pipe and rotates a tool module that produces a cutting action. With the older design of the tool, as you can see in this video, it can contain multiple protruding components, all of which can create pinch points and increase the risk for caught in between injuries and amputations. Um, so as the tool module rotates around the frame, as you can see here, this worker operating this machine can potentially crush his fingers if it is between one of these stationary components. And you can also see the potential pinch points in our solution page highlighted in the yellow exclamations in this figure. So to help prevent this, the manufacturer Tri-Tool patented a new design that eliminates the components that stick out of the rotating frame by housing them all inside. Um, by expanding the solution, you can find more information and details about the models of this tool called Trimax, or visit the manufacturer's link on the right-hand side under Availability. Moving on to our next solution, let's talk about prefabricated slab formwork systems. In short, formwork are basically temporary molds that are set in place before concrete is poured and then cured to form the building structures. Now, traditionally, formwork are constructed out of lumber, so there are multiple occupational risks that workers can face when building these things. For instance, workers may face the risk of falling off unprotected sides when they are setting up ad hoc guardrails at an elevated work surface or near a leading edge. 
Workers may sustain cuts and punctures from using tools such as nail guns and saws, or even workers below a level of the structure may be at risk of struck by falling objects when workers are building these wooden structures above them. There are also risks for musculoskeletal injuries and disorders from repetitive lifting of individual lumber formwork components. So, this solution uses prefabricated slab formwork system is a PTD process that addresses all of these risks I just described. Each system generally contains already built panels called tables, as you can see here, uh, that concrete is poured on. And these are made from lightweight aluminum materials, so that addresses the risk for ergonomic injuries since they can easily be maneuvered around the job site. Fall risks are addressed because these tables are propped, before these tables are propped up, guardrails may already be attached to the edge of these systems, um, thus eliminating the need for them to build them above the ground. And because these systems are pre-engineered, they can easily interconnect to each other without the requirement of tools, thus also eliminating the risks associated with handling tools. If you want to learn more about these systems, you could refer to the manufacturers listed on the right-hand side. It's not a comprehensive list of all existing manufacturers, but nevertheless, still a good representation of some of the commercially available choices out there. The prefabricated wall and column system uh, is pretty much similar to the prefab slab system solution in the previous slide, except these formwork systems are pre-engineered molds for vertical components of building structures, such as walls and columns. The main difference between this solution and the previous one is the information on the general components of the system and how to assemble them. Otherwise, the solution also reduces or eliminates the risk for ergonomic injuries, tool-associated hazards, and falls from an elevated work surface or a leading edge. Which brings us to our next PTD solution I want to talk about, a leading edge fall protection system. So structural iron workers face unique fall hazards during metal decking installation during the construction of steel frame buildings. So it is during this task, iron workers typically spread metal sheets over narrow structural beams to form the building's flooring, which constantly creates a new working surface called the leading edge. Because of these leading edges with unprotected sides or the collapse of these platform surfaces, iron workers die from falls at a rate of 10 times higher than the uh, construction average. And you can learn more about the statistics by clicking on the CPWR resource link on the right side. Now, some conventional fall protection methods are effective for many structures, uh, structural steel erection tasks, but they are impractical for leading edge decking work. For one, guardrails cannot be attached at the leading edge because the decking zone constantly is moving forward as new decking is laid down. Safety nets, which must be placed under the work zone, are also not practical for use because, again, it's constantly moving uh, for the working surface. Not to mention it also requires 25 feet of clearance, which may not be available due to the middle deck or floor below. And as for conventional horizontal lifelines, a worker's lanyard is attached to these, attached to these uh, lifelines are typical, typically below the shoulder level, which creates a fall distance that could still allow the worker to hit the deck below when they fall off a leading, leading edge. So to help address these issues, researchers for CPWR uh, looked into an above the shoulder fall arrest system and did some evaluation studies over the course of three and a half years on six different construction sites and found that this leading edge fall protection system um, enabled six workers to perform self-rescue and to escape without injury. Basically, the solution incorporates a PTD pre-planning process with fabricators that requires the specification of pre-punched holes in structural steel columns. So if I collapse this solution again, you can see the pre-punched holes at intervals of 42 inch and 21 inch for the cable guardrails and about seven foot for a horizontal lifeline so that workers can attach the harness to. And all of this is done before the steel columns are erected on a job site. 
So once you expand the solution, you can learn more about how the system is in application and how to implement it. So here's an example of the leading edge system. Next up, if I could click on the next. John Gampati is one of the pioneers of PTD in construction, stated that designing for construction safety entails addressing the safety of construction workers in the design of permanent features of the project. So for the remaining six PTD solutions I would like to talk about are geared towards preventing fall hazards through building design. And these are developed by the OSHA Alliance Program Construction Roundtable. Starting with this solution, the idea is to have specification of fixed ladders or stairways during the design of a, during the design stage of a building. It's pretty straightforward. Having these permanent structures in place can help eliminate workers using portable ladders or aerial lifts, particularly in areas where workers require access the most and where manual material handling is expected. Fixed ladders and stairways meeting federal regulatory guidance are more structurally stable than portable ladders, scaffolds, and lifts. And also having fixed access to work at heights reduces the risk of back injuries and other related injuries associated with carrying or placing or installing these portable equipment, scaffolds, and ladders. So it's important for me to note that the designating the installation of these fixed systems and any other related uh, building features should rely on the guidance of a competent person with structural engineering experience and adhering to the guidance of OSHA standards. So upon visiting the solution, you can learn more about the OSHA requirements when uh, designing fixed lat stairways and details for safe and efficient fixed ladders. For our next solution, a subcomponent uh, safety feature of having fixed ladders, design should specify that ladder rungs also serve as convenient um, grab bars when workers are ascending and descending these ladders. This solution is to help promote workers use the three-point control technique shown on the left-hand side of this picture, as opposed to just a three-point contact technique on the right. When workers use the side railings, or other vertical support members for contact support, there may be uncontrolled sliding of the hands in the event of a fall. But grabbing onto horizontal grab bars, as you can see on the left, provides a greater safety margin for preventing a fall since they are easier to grab. And their approximate circumference should be between one to one and a half inches. And there are actual fascinating biomechanical studies reinforcing the safety benefits of having these grab bars. In one study, Rabinovich shows that a full physical human muscular response typically takes a third of a second. On the other hand, a response time for a sliding hand to fully grip, grip the next level uh, ladder rung 12 inches below an attempt to stop a fall is a quarter of a second, which is much shorter than a typical human response. In addition to this, uh, another biomechanical study funded by CPWR actually quantified the maximum breakaway force if the hand is forcibly pulled away from the support. So results show gripping onto the horizontal grab bar optimizes hand grip strength capacities because it requires 75 to 94 percent greater breakaway force when gripping a vertical component for support. And so the next couple of solutions, I wanted to talk about designing anchor system into buildings that can benefit uh, workers during construction as well as the repair and maintenance phases of the building. As some of you may know, working on scaffolds at a height that is more than four times its base as a general rule becomes inherently unstable, even if it is plumb and square to the ground. So it is an OSHA requirement that building ties are available to help anchorage the scaffold to the structure in order to provide support and stability to resist wind and other lateral loads. Typically, these building ties are embedded in joints between the bricks and mortars and then filled with a vernier mortar, which is then given 24-hour secure before you can connect the scaffold to them. So if you look at the picture and visualize this, the process of securing a tie usually stops before the green bracket in this picture right here. 
where you just have an eye bolt sitting in between the bricks and filled with joint filling. But designing buildings to include permanent tie-in anchor system is stronger than relying on the strength of day-old veneer to secure these tie-ins. And the reason is because the eye bolt is threaded into the metal bracket anchor shown here in the green, which is in turn permanently attached to the inner structural core of a building, whether it is drilled into a concrete slab or bolted to metal framing. So the best way to summarize the system is it's pretty much an anchor for an anchor. Uh, and from a practicality standpoint, these systems provide convenience and a life cycle benefit for future building maintenance when scaffolding is needed. Oftentimes for aesthetic purposes, when building construction is finished, these traditional times are usually cut off and it is up to the future maintenance crews to figure out how to secure the scaffolds. However, utilizing the system allows for reusable tie-ins because of the convenience to screw them back in once it is deemed safe by a competent person. And you can learn more by visiting the manufacturer, again, on the right-hand side of this page. The next PTD solution on permanent roof anchors is very straightforward, so I will briefly go over it. it generally focuses on the identification and inclusion of permanent anchors in the design of the roof such that they can be used as tie-off points for connecting personal fall equipment when it is required during the construction and maintenance activities over the life cycle of a building. But most importantly, I think the takeaway point on having permanent anchorage points is to also help reduce the chance for workers unknowingly connect their fall protection gear to something that may not be structurally sound or certified by a professional engineer, which would have otherwise been addressed in the design stage of the process. The final couple of PTD solutions would be related to rails. As you know, guardrails are the primary uh, fall protection in construction and are required by OSHA for unprotected sides and edges that is six feet or more above a lower level. Having guardrails installed to minimize or even eliminate the need for roof anchors to connect their personal fall rest equipment, temporary barricades, or warning signs during operation and maintenance tasks. Now, the closest I've had with setting foot on a rail staircase in dreamy multi-million dollar modern homes was actually visiting some of these commercial building construction sites. And not being good with heights, I remember almost hugging against the wall when walking up and down these steps without handrails in place, especially since lighting was not so bright during my early morning visits. And it's pretty dangerous, not to mention some of these staircases can be slippery as well when uh, working in freezing environments. So this is a PTD solution that addresses worker exposure to falls by specifying cast-in sockets around floor openings or exposed open sides like an atrium that's being built, which make it easy for contractors to install temporary guardrails. And the sockets can also be used for permanent railings later on. Finally, the proper design of roof parapets at a height of at least 39 inches and a test load capable of withstanding at least 200 pounds of force is a PTD process that eliminates worker exposure to falls during the design stage. So roof parapets are part of the wall assembly that extend above the roof and can be and can prevent falls from uh, flat low slope roofs. So they are essentially built in guardrails for the building. However, for the parapet walls that do not meet the re minimum requirement height when they were designed, there are also manufacturers that we have listed on the right that allows for the guardrail systems to be clamped on. And speaking of which, I actually drove past the dry cleaners this morning where the building actually had a parapet wall less than two feet tall. And I would otherwise miss it if I didn't see a guy in a red polo shirt just walking around. So sure, guardrail clamps would be ideal to guard the unprotected edges uh, for that building when it, the parapet wall wasn't designed to be at least uh, a guardrail 39 inches height. But this, that scenario could have been prevented if the proper height design of the parapet wall was considered. And I'm not sure if Mike is back on, but uh, this actually concludes my portion of introducing some of the uh, PTD solutions uh, that could be uh, applicable in the construction industry. And um, 
if uh, Mike is available, I will now hand it over to him. Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, Mike is back on, um, so we will go ahead and get you back over to him. Um, so yeah, thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for bearing with us with the order change and technical difficulties. And Mike, you should be all set. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Sorry about that, folks. Um, phone just knocked out. So we'll start with uh, the slide section uh, five here, where we talked about, again, the ability to implement safety is very important in the design aspect of, of the building, because as you get towards the end, towards startup and occupancy, uh, the ability to implement safety through design is a lot tougher. So um, again, within the, um, the realm of our technical report, we chose to take a building life cycle approach. Uh, Chris just mentioned it a couple times about the life cycle and because construction is important, obviously, when the building is built, but there's many construction firms also do retrofit and repair, operations and maintenance and demolition and decommissioning at the end of the life cycle of the building. So. We, we took the approach of addressing the life cycle of the PTD, and, uh, and that was the theme of the other technical report, which is still under review, but, uh, but this technical report, the, the audience of this, of this report was the design community, the architects, engineers, and owners, um, sort of as a persuasive type of a document. There's information in there, certainly, uh, about PTD, but we're trying to reach the owner and uh, the design community, the architects, engineers, and owners, to, to let them know that, that design, preventative design is very important uh, for the life cycle of the building. We developed this graph, which is in the, in the technical report. It sort of shows that when you design, uh, to use design principles with everybody involved, the general contractor as well as the trades contractors early in the process through new construction, and then on the right-hand side there you have operations, maintenance, uh, repair, and retrofit, and then demolition final of the building. So, this sort of sums it up what we our approach to it within the uh, the life cycle of the uh, the technical report. Many of you are familiar with the hierarchy of controls, and this is important for preventative design because if you eliminate it, design it out, you have the best control effectiveness as well as business value, which is important for preventative design. Realizing that there are several motivations, numerous motivations for doing preventative design, but within our technical report, we chose to focus on three. And they are ethical and sustainability, business case of prevention through design, and the proven successes of implementing PTD principles. And so those are the three focuses that we chose to address. So we talk about sustainability, fairly new concept within a number of different industries and businesses, but you're talking about this triangle of economic viability to make, make things economically sustainable, the environment is important, and social equity. So these three focuses and the sustainability aspect of it is very important for prevention through design, as well as the ethical reasons. Um, a number of organizations are, are already addressing it, and these are two examples within the uh, National Society of Professional Engineers Code of Ethics, where they say the engineers shall help hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. So that certainly meets that definition, as well as the Society of Civil Engineers Code of Ethics, where they talk about the health, health and welfare of the general public. So the, the ethics is there. The, 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 the community of, of uh, design community, uh, they understand it. I think they understand the, the importance of it. It's just a matter of how do they then incorporate it into their plans and designs. And the business value is also very important. Injuries and fatalities cost money as well as a lot more. A lot of good reasons to prevent injuries and fatalities. But the return investment analysis, if that can be done during the construction phase um, and design phase, I think that the engineers, architects and engineers, and the owners will be able to see the cost savings throughout the, the, the four major phases of the, of the building. And so that's one thing that we're trying to get across in the white paper in the technical report as well. Proven successes of implementing PTD principles. Um, PTD is not a new concept. You can go back as far as 1955, National Safety Council's document for industrial operations of safety by safety through design. Uh, a number of organizations um, are, are doing, uh, the engineer procurement and construct contractors have been doing it for years uh, within the power, petrochemical, and pharmaceutical industry. The highway construction industry has an asphalt paving partnership that, that addresses it. The NIOSH initiative workshops in 2007, 2011. 
Uh, CPWR, you just heard from Chris, CPWR has been involved with, with convention design for a number of years. Uh, DOE, the military, Army Corps of Engineers, OSHA obviously is getting on board. They have a website avail available for that. Again, large owner design firms. And then on the international aspect, the United Kingdom is well ahead of this. They, de they developed a number of regulations and rules for prevention through design in the United Kingdom, and other countries throughout the world have, have gotten on board with it as well. So again, anchorage points are, are typical, some of the like, PTD examples. Uh, Chris just gave some great examples in his presentation right there. Uh, anchorage points are very important. S protecting skylights, not only during construction, but um, as the building, uh, once the building's built, if you're building cages and, and things like that. Chris mentioned parapet walls, very important. Challenges to implementing PTD. This is again part of the, uh, the, the focus of the, white, of the uh, technical report because there are challenges and certainly with any, any new concept, there's going to be doubt, there's going to be problems, there's going to be issues that need to get, get worked out. And so within the technical report, we chose to use two or just two of the, of the lists you see there and there are others I'm sure, but the designer's fear of liability um, is something that's been out there, there's been articles written about it, and also con contracts and PTD. How PTD is addressed within the contract of the building uh, and of the uh, overall building aspect is important because the contracts set to how the, the building will be built as well as operated and maintained and such. So the contracts are, are the written document that spells it out of how PTD should and uh, should be incorporated. And there's other reasons to um, the lack of PTD awareness in the design community, weak and absent regulatory requirements, and things like that. But in the technical report, we chose to address the first two. Tools and processes to support and enhance PTD. There are a number of organizations out there that have some great resources. Um, owner project for, to address owner project requirements. There's a number of model PTD programs out there. Um, construct, constructability review is important. There's design checklist, lean principles, and then uh, building information modeling and virtual reality are great tools for implementing PTD because that, with those tools you can actually see the benefits of it. You can identify um, safety and health hazards before the building's built within a virtual reality setting, which is great to be able to apply PTD principles uh, before the building even, um, before they even break ground. Uh, Chris, I think, mentioned a little bit about prefabrication. Pre a lot of work in the construction industry is being done in prefabrication settings, settings basically in a warehouse or somewhere off-site. They've been now referring to prefabrication as off-site construction, and there's a number of different things, uh, steel stairs, concrete walls, um, MEP rack systems within our industry, within HVAC and sheet metal, MEP rack, rack systems are being built and installed um, they're being built off-site and then they're being installed on the site. So obviously, prefabrication is a way to address PTD before the building is built. And then finally, um, the US GBC, um, working with NIOSH and CPWR, have been out there and now is a, a, a lead PTD pilot point that can be, that can be um, obtained when you go through the lead process. So again, a lot PTD is getting involved with a lot of different organizations and, and groups that are pushing it, and hopefully through awareness and through uh, education and app, uh, applying PTD principles early on within the construction phase, hopefully uh, we can get to a point where PTD is accepted and it's, it's just a part of doing business. That's, I think, what we want to get to with PTD. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a consideration. It should be a part of actually doing it because not, not necessarily required at this point, but certainly um, seeing the benefits so that um, all workers are protected through construction, uh, operations and maintenance, retrofitting, and then finally through the, um, the demolition phase. So um, I think that's, that's pretty much it for, for my presentation. So um, sorry for the uh, mishap earlier, but I'll, I'll give it back to Jessica and maybe we can answer some questions. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, and again, just to reiterate that, we apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I do have a couple questions coming in. Uh, the first one is uh, about, it comes from a, um, a large subcontractor, and it's about uh, 
you know, what do you do if you're not involved in the design process? Um, so do you have any recommendations or is there anything in the paper um, geared toward, you know, more safety-minded contractors and what they can do to assist with implementing PTD when they are really not brought into the design process? Or are we just reliant on owners, engineers, architects to make that happen? Well, I think two things. Number one, um, there's certainly PTD principles that any any contractor can do on their own. Um, just within how you do safety and health, you can you can apply a lot of these uh, principal design principles just in the way that you do your work. Work with your own specific workers. Maybe have a relationship with a general contractor for a specific project, and maybe you can implement some things. But from the project standpoint, it is very important. One of the graphs I showed earlier talked about the uh, the need for um, so with this graph here, the fact that the, the owners and, and their agent, whoever that would be, working with the, the A&E firm, certainly needs to get the general contractor and the trade contractors involved as soon as possible because they're the ones who have to implement the, the PTD or deal with the lack of the PTD. My suggestion would be to contact, you know, early on in the project, whether it's, you know, with your estimators or your design people or, you know, well before the proposal stage, when the project comes out, do some, some contacts with the, the um, if there's already a general contractor or, or a construction design firm named, maybe contact them early on to see what, what input you can have with them at least, who then maybe then can maybe um, get you involved with the architect and engineers um, early on. But um, again, you can try and work with the construction firm or a construction contractor, general contractor, or um, apply some things on your own. Okay, thank you. Um, and similarly, uh, do you have any recommendations on getting how to get clients to modify existing buildings? Or have you touched on much of that in your report? Well, again, since, since we talk about the life cycle, um, once the building is up, um, the design aspect is a little bit tougher. Now, some of the slides that, uh, that Chris was talking about also relate to the new, there's a new general industry standard where um, for walking working surfaces, which dictates that a lot of these, um, these access devices like ladders and stairways and such will need to be designed. They're, they're grandfathered in, they have a certain amount of time. It, it's out to, I think, like 2030 or sometime. So there will be significant design changes to, to many facilities and buildings that will need to be done. But it is a lot more difficult once the building is up. And again, if you see if you see a need, if you're doing some retrofit work, if you see a need for something, try and work with the owner to see if they can do something retroactively would be the best bet. But it's very difficult to put true principles of design into a building once it's up. But you can still do some retrofit to it to make to make it safer. Okay. Um, next question is: How can a worker know if an anchor on a roof is strong enough? <laughs> That's a good, that's a very good question, obviously. Chris, you want to take some of that maybe, or maybe part of um, you had? Well, I mean, from my understanding, it's, uh, it's part of the design process where um, during the design phase, like, they have to be signed off by a professional engineering, uh, safety engineer. So what happens is, like, uh, once they deem it uh, that's it's strong enough to withstand a certain amount of, like, uh, force, like, uh, that's when it's clear. Like, that's from my understanding, at least. We, they need to have like some sort of uh, uh, engineer on 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 staff when they uh, make go through these uh, designs before they could be signed off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you can certainly work with the building owner. Um, maybe they may have some paperwork that when the building was built, or if they had some sort of a proactive or a retroactive kind of a um, a survey, like Chris just mentioned, by a professional engineer. But that, that's what you would need. You would need documentation from a PE that uh, that shows that it that it was um, you know constructed properly. Okay. Um, the next question is about whether the technical report is publicly available. And I know you said it's still in the review process, I believe. Um, but uh, do you intend to make it publicly available? If so, yes. where? Yeah, this is, um, so again, this was developed through the um, anti-ASSE A10 
the Committee for Construction and Demolition Standards, which we are a member, SMAC is a member, a lot, number of organizations belong to this, the 810 Committee. And so ASSC, the American Society for Safety Engineers, which is now the American Society of Safety Professionals, um, they are the secretariat for the, for the standards uh, committee. And so once, the, once it gets through the review process, right now it's, it's in the administrative review, it will be going out for public comment within the next few months. And then once it's finalized, it will be made available through ASSE and their website. Okay, great. Um, next question is, uh, what is the pilot number? I'm not sure what that's referring to. The lead is that the lead that you were mentioning towards the end, Mike? Yeah, yeah. It's probably uh, the, it's, it's, yeah. I think it's the, the pilot. Um, it, it's basically it's a point that you can get for when you go through your lead process. If you there's a checklist and this is just a picture slide. But if you go to the lead, uh, the USCBC lead website and you look and you search under prevention to design, you'll see what the criteria is for getting the one point in your lead scoring if you apply PTD principles. Okay, um, and do they have the uh, checklist available there as well? There was another question about the checklist for for PTD. Um, is that accessible on this on the lead site, or uh, do you have access to it? Well, the lead site will have. I don't know if it's so much a checklist. It's just the requirements uh, that would be that you need to to have for the for the lead. Um, but you can also. Um, there's a very, if you search uh, prevention to design and construction, um, earlier in my opening slide, I gave credit to Mike Toole and John Gambatis, who are two specialists in PTD uh, on a national basis, international basis. Um, and there, there is a website for, it's, it, again, it's construction safety or construction in PTD. If you search that, um, that has a lot of resources, including a number of checklists and, and related information. Okay, um, and someone else did just make a comment that um, they've seen a downloadable uh, Microsoft Word document on the um, lead site as well, referring to this. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question here that I can answer. Um, will this presentation with audio be sent to participants? And yes, it will. Um, so it just, there's a little bit of a delay before the recording is available, um, but I will be sending it out to everyone who participated tomorrow uh, by the end of the day, so you will be able to access uh, the full recording. All right, and I think uh, that is actually the end of our questions so far. Do we have any more questions before we sign off? Well, if I missed something, um, feel free to shoot me an email, and I will put you in contact with Chris and Mike um, so we can get any questions uh, answered after the fact. Um, and if you uh, come up with any questions that were not asked on this webinar, again, feel free to email me, and I will be sending out an email to all of you uh, tomorrow, as I said. And thank you so much, Mike and Chris, for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. Bye-bye.